Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, this is the first of our um, series from the, the Smadler's Library Special Collections uh, people. They've been kind enough to speak here many uh, times in the past, and it's always interesting. Today, our speaker is uh, Boyd Murphy, and Boyd actually spoke in the last series as well. Um, Boyd is uh, um, the archivist of the Florida um, uh, special collections of political papers. Um, and um, he's also a um, uh, historian of note. In fact, I don't think there, I know of anybody who knows more about uh, Florida history than Boyd. He, um, he, he wrote a book called The uh, Governors of Florida, which was published by um, Florida Press and uh, won the gold medal in 2020 for a Florida um, nonfiction. Uh, he's also um, um, interested in uh, history of the American Civil War, Cold War history, and political, uh, uh, political history in, in general. He received his PhD from Florida State and uh, we're here to welcome him to speak today about some Florida governors and their relationship to Tallahassee. Should be fun. Thank you, Ron, and thank all of y'all for being here uh, this morning. It's great to be here again. Uh, you might be wondering, since we're sitting here in Gainesville, why I'm going to be talking about Tallahassee, Gainesville's rival uh, university town. Uh, I grew up in Tallahassee. I was actually born in Key West, but my dad took a job with the Department of Education, and so we moved there. And so I spent most of my formative years in Tallahassee. Uh, and a as Ron mentioned, I, I went to graduate school at Florida State, but now I'm very happy to be working at the University of Florida. I've been here since 2016, but it's really only been official that I've been the political papers archivist uh, since uh, the middle of January this year. I was working de facto in that position, but now it's official. Um, oh, thank you. Um, so, uh, as Ron said, I've done a lot of work on Florida's governors, and I'm from Tallahassee, and as many of you may know, this year is the bicentennial of Tallahassee's founding in 1824. Uh, the town was, of course, laid out as a compromise between Pensacola uh, and um, St. Augustine, you know, to have a place in the middle because it was, took them so long to go around to each of the two capitals uh, before that. And so uh, tomorrow I'm going to be speaking in Tallahassee on the same topic. So you're getting the um, <laughs> the um, the first show, I guess, uh, if you will. Um, and since this is the bicentennial year of Tallahassee, I thought it would be interesting to look at the relationship uh, ships between some of the governors and the state capitol. Obviously. All of the governors, with the exception of Andrew Jackson, who was really the first military slash territorial governor, all of the governors have lived, at least for part of their term, in Tallahassee, the, the, the seat of government. And some of them have had a, a especially close relationship to the city. Um, 10 out of our 51 governors are, um, died in Tallahassee. Not... Well, there were a couple that died in office, but 10 of them died in Tallahassee. Eight out of the 10 are buried in Tallahassee or in Leon County. Um, and I'm going to look at um, three of the governors who died and are buried in Tallahassee, and one who was the first governor to die in office. Uh, so I'm going to be stepping back. Uh, my field is political history, but uh, I'm especially interested in the 19th century. So I guess that's where I feel most comfortable when I'm talking about uh, history. So we're going back to the territorial period to begin with. I'll be talking about Richard Keith Cull, uh, 
and who was territorial governor twice, uh, Robert Raymond Reed, another territorial governor, Thomas Brown, who was our second governor under statehood, and then John Milton, uh, who died in office during the Civil War. Okay, but before we jump back in time, I wanted to say a couple of words about two of the governors who were born uh, and died in Leon County or Tallahassee, uh, and these governors are uh, William Dunnington Bloxham. Uh, there's a newspaper article there about him uh, on the left, and then Le Leroy Collins, uh, who, of course, was governor during the uh, 1950s. Um, both of these men were born in Tallahassee, and on July 9th, 1935, the city had a huge celebration uh, to commemorate the birth of William Dunnington Bloxham. It was the centennial of his birth. He was born in July of 1835. Uh, Bloxham served two terms as governor. He was the first person to serve two terms. And back in that time, you could not serve consecutive terms, but he was elected twice. So he was the 13th and 17th governor under statehood. Uh, 1881 to 1885 was his first term. And then several years later, right on the cusp of the 20th century, 1897 to 1901. Uh, he died in 1911 and and this will be very local, but anyway, he's buried at St. John's Episcopal Church Cemetery in Tallahassee. Several of these governors were Episcopalian. Uh, also, if you go to Tallahassee and you go to Calhoun Street, uh, the Bloxham House still stands there. Uh, uh, and uh, you know, he had the he had that house in town. He also had a plantation on the outskirts of town. Um, after he left his first term, the governor who replaced him, Edward A. Perry, actually rented the house. There was not a governor's mansion at that time, even though the Constitution called for, you know, making provision for a place for the governors to live. They hadn't gotten around to doing that, so um, Governor Perry actually rented that. Um, Bloxham is probably best known for the Diston land purchase in which the state uh, was able to sell a lot of the land in, in South Florida that they had received from the federal government uh, in this investment from Hamilton Diston, who was an investor in railroads and so forth. And some historians would say this began the, you know, the real growth of, uh, uh, slowly, but the real growth of South Florida. Um, he is also known, uh, unfortunately, as really the upholder of Southern white um, political control in Florida. So after Reconstruction, Bloxham was elected, uh, even though he had a very, by all accounts, he was even called the smiling man because he had a very jovial personality. He was from that school of you know, white Southerners who wanted to end Reconstruction and wanted to make sure that black Floridians had no voice uh, in the political arena. On the other hand, Leroy Collins, who uh, this picture is from 1935, um, he was just in the state legislature at that time. Um, he was at this ceremony rep representing the House of Representatives because he was from Leon County. Um, and uh, Collins uh, read out this tribute to Bloxham. Um, both men had served in the House at the same age, at age 26. Collins is 26 years old in this picture. Collins, like Bloxham, when at first, you know, and during his political career, because that was the fact of life at the time, supported segregation. But as many of you know, he was the first governor to try to start ending segregation in our state. So just a little introduction there, looking at these two men who were born and who died in Leon County. So let's go back now in time to the 1830s.
the territorial governor, Richard Keith Call. There's Call's picture there on the left. On the right is a picture of his, his wife. And of course, uh, in the middle, many of you may have visited this uh, building. It's now a museum. The building called The Grove, which was Call's residence in downtown Tallahassee. It's right next door to the governor's mansion today. Uh, but he also had a large plantation on the outskirts of the city. Um, in 1836, on March 16th, 1836, President Andrew Jackson um, appointed Call to be territorial governor. Uh, so, the, you know, really the height of his political career. He had been the lieutenant of Jackson's in the War of 1812 when they were fighting the Creeks in what is today Alabama. Uh, he was one of the men who, um, when Florida, when the United States under Jackson acquired Florida, uh, was um, in Pensacola where he was an attorney and also had some uh, local government offices. He served in the Legislative Council, as the state legislature was called then. Uh, he also was appointed to be um, basically in charge or in charge of the money part of this office, the public land office in Tallahassee, which was an immensely influential position because most people, white people that were moving into the territory were interested in acquiring land. They had to go through call to get it. He was also a big speculator in lands and made a lot of money and lost a lot of money uh, speculating in, in real estate. Um, he was also a leading investor in the Tallahassee Railroad, which was the first railroad in the territory, the first railroad, of course, in the state later, which ran from Tallahassee down to the coast at St. Mark's. So in March of 1836, he's proud. He's been appointed um, to be territorial governor, kind of the pinnacle of his, you know, political career so far. But at the same time, he is in mourning because only a couple of weeks before, his wife, Mary Letitia Kirkman Call, and again, her picture is up there, had died uh, at the Grove, which was actually still under construction, uh, leaving him with two young daughters. All of their other children, six other children had died between 1826 and 1832. As we all know, back then, the child uh, mortality was just you know, incredible. So, uh, he, so he was happy he's governor, but he's also mourning the loss of his wife. Um, during uh, 1836, Call was put in charge of the ongoing campaign against the Seminole Indians in territorial Florida. As you might know, the Second Seminole War, as it became to be called, broke out in December of 1835. A string of generals had not had much success against the Seminole, including Winfield Scott, maybe our greatest general at that time. And so between the appointment of Scott, excuse me, between the command of Scott and then later the appointment of General Jessup, Andrew Jackson, who was still president, gave Call, who was territorial governor, also gave him authority to command the militia and the federal troops that were in Florida fighting the Seminole. And Call had, you know, said, you know, I can... I can win, you know, we're these professional soldiers. He had been a soldier in his early life, but he's making this claim that, you know, I can take care of this problem. Well, like all these other generals, Call failed in the fall of 1836. And Jackson was so angry because Call had said, you know, this is going to be, I'm going to do this and we're going to win and so forth, uh, that he dismissed him from that command. So this was a huge humiliation for him, maybe the greatest disgrace of his pro professional life. Um, so, but he remained as territorial governor um, the, in the last years of his term, and this is his first term, um, he'll have one other. Uh, he had to deal with the repercussions of the panic of 1837, which was a financial collapse in the country of 
uh, many of the country's banks, and particularly in Florida, uh, banks were already in trouble, but this really pushed them over the edge. So he has to deal with that. He has to deal with the fall in cotton prices that goes along with this depression. And of course, he and all these other rich white men uh, in Leon County and other counties in Florida make most a lot of their money off of cotton. I mean, Paul made it off cotton and off selling land and speculating in land and as an attorney, but he still suffered from that depression personally. Um, also, during his first term, uh, delegates go to the little town of St. Joseph's on the coast, which is now the little town of Port St. Joe, you may have been there, to create Florida's first constitution. Florida's a territory, one of the steps in becoming a state is to create a constitution, and they did that in 1838. Excuse me. Well, by the time uh, the Constitution is being created, and by the end of Paul's term, which is going to be in November of 1839, Call is no longer really a supporter of Andrew Jackson and what has become known as the Democratic Party. He had been, but he's not now, because you know Jackson had dismissed him. They also had he had real political disagreements with the Jackson administration. He was generally a supporter of banks. Andrew Jackson was not. And the factions that control the Democratic Party really at that time in territorial Florida were basically so-called anti-bank men. They believed that banks, unregulated banks, were the source of this depression and that they needed to be, if not done away with, they needed to be uh, heavily supervised. So Call is now becoming a part of this new political movement that becomes a party, the Whig Party. Um, and so since he's known now as a Whig, really, the successor to Andrew Jackson, Martin Van Buren, who was a diehard Democrat, a real political operator, he ends up you know, dismissing Call as the territorial governor to replace him with a firm ally a firm Democrat by the name of Robert Raymond Reed. However, and we'll come to Reed in a second, Call, as I've said, does serve a second term. Reed is only in there for a short period. The Whigs win big in 1840. Um, Martin Van Buren loses. So the Whigs win uh, under William Henry Harrison. Call was an outspoken supporter of Harrison's. So as most of you know, Harrison did not live very long as president, only a few weeks. You know, he caught pneumonia and died. And then John Tyler, the vice president, became president. But during his time in office, Harrison appointed Call once again to be territorial governor. So he's going to be in there from um, 1841 until he'll be replaced by John Branch in 1844. And basically, his second term is, again, taken up with the issue of, well, the kind of the last remnants of the Seminole War, but mainly with that ongoing financial crisis. Florida, the South, and much of the country is still in a big uh, depression. So Call leaves office in May of 1845, after you know Florida became a state in March of 1845. He ran as a Whig against the Democrat William D. Mosley for governor. He lost that uh, race. Mosley be becomes our first governor under statehood. And so in the remaining years of his life, and he will live until 1862, he devoted most of his time to his plantation and Orchard Pond, which, is, which was uh, northwest of Tallahassee. Um, of course, he owned, you know, a hundred, 150 uh, slaves and slave persons. Um, so he was a big supporter of slavery, and, and he wrote about in defense of slavery, but he was also a big unionist in the sense of, I want this country to stay together. That, that had been Jackson's big thing, you know, had the nullification crisis in the 1830s, and Jackson had, as president, had firmly opposed that, 
move by South Carolina to nullify federal laws. And, and call is just like Jackson in that respect. We must keep the country together. That's the main thing. And so he warns as this sectional crisis intensifies in the 1850s and especially after, you know, in the late, well, the 1840s and then the 1850s after the war with Mexico and we're acquiring new territory. And the big question is, is slavery going to expand into those territories? Most Southern slave owners, or many of them wanted that to happen. Others though, like Call was saying, you know, the North opposes that. We have abolitionists in the North. The slavery issue is going to destroy the country. And so he was totally opposed to Florida seceding from the Union uh, which it did on January 10th, 1861. And there's a famous story uh, with Call. After the secession vote had been taken in the Capitol building in Tallahassee, some youth, youthful supporters of secession, and you know, the town was going crazy celebrating that, went to Governor Call because they knew he was this old, you know, unionist. And we're kind of like saying, hey, what do you think now? You know, Florida's on its own. We're going to make a new nation, a Confederate nation. So, and he said, well, what you've done, and this is a quote, you have opened the gates of hell from which shall flow the curses of the damned, which shall sink you to perdition. So uh, you could tell calls stand on secession from that quote. And also, of course, you know, I'm sure he's thinking in terms of the North being so strong and the South being so weak that this would end up in a disaster for the South. Uh, in fact, the Civil War, as we know, begins in April of 1861. Call dies in September of 1862. Um, he had another personal tragedy in June of 1862. His beloved nephew, George W. Call, was killed at the Battle of Seven Pines in Virginia. So that probably hastened his decline. Uh, he died uh, at the grove uh, where he is buried. There's his headstone there. Um, he was a big mason like a lot of the early uh, founders of the territory in the state. Uh, and uh, he was a member of St. John's Episcopal Church too. So anyway, so that's Governor Richard Keith Call. Now I want to turn to Governor Robert Raymond Reed. Um, can I get the time? Okay, thank you. So, as I mentioned, Robert Raymond Reed will replace uh, uh, Call after Call's first term. So, he was our fourth territorial governor. Uh, serving between calls two terms. He's a fascinating but tragic figure. And although his term was very short from December 2nd, 1839 until March 19th, 1841, it was one of the most tumultuous in territorial history. Uh, if Reed is remembered for anything, it may be for his role in creating Florida's first constitution at the Constitutional Convention in St. Joseph in 1838 and the beginning of 1839, he was elected by one vote as the to be the president of the Constitutional Convention. He had been, he was a serving federal judge in what was then called East Florida, which was basically everything, all of Florida south of the Suwannee River headquartered in St. Augustine. So he was a prominent a jurist, and also prominent Democratic politician. He may also be known for his wife, uh, Mary Martha Reed. Um, she established the Florida Hospital in Richmond during the Civil War. Um, but for historians, his lasting legacy probably is the diary that he kept periodically from the 1820s to the 1840s. We don't have all of this diary, but what we do have shows a very introspective, highly educated man with an interest in philosophy and religion. While he might have been a Baptist in his early years, when you read his diary and he clearly talks about Unitarianism, he's really a Unitarian uh, by the 1830s. 
he struggles with religious questions uh, and, and an attempt to deal with his inner demons, which he had many. Uh, and his nature, he had, a, uh, he had a love of nature, excuse me, and his philosophical bent went well with that period, which is, this coincides with the Romantic Age, so I've called him the Romantic Age governor, the period of, you know, earlier with Byron and the poets and uh, romantic literature and art and so forth, and sometimes when you read entries from his diary, he even sounds like a, another great writer of that Romantic Age, Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, and let me just give you an example. On October 13th, 1831, he wrote, um, I am now upward of 42 years of age, and how, upon examination, close and rigorous examination, do I find myself? Worse in circumstances, worse in habits, worse in feelings. Nothing can excuse my downward course but absolute madness, madness occasioned by misfortune, excess of misfortune. God help me. I am most unworthy to even offer a prayer to the great and mysterious being by whom I have been sorely and justly chastened. So you can see the Poe maybe a little bit in there. He had every right to be depressed, like Richard Keith Call. Reed outlived many of his children and outlived two of his three wives. Uh, he was born in South Carolina in 1789. He became a lawyer in Augusta, Georgia, uh, was a judge there. He was an ally of the Georgia politician John Forsyth, who became Secretary of State under Andrew Jackson. And because of this patronage in 1832, Jackson appointed Reed to be the um, to the federal bench as judge for Florida's Eastern Judicial District, as I mentioned, centered in St. Augustine. He loved St. Augustine, by the way, uh, because of its old world environment, might have appealed to his romantic nature. Uh, Tallahassee, however, uh, although he later described it, he, he later didn't have a lot of love for Tallahassee, is full of filth of all genders with dirty houses and indifferent people. When he first came to the city in January of 1833, and he came to Tallahassee because as one of the four district judges in January and February of each year, they came to Tallahassee to sit kind of as a Supreme Court, if you will. We didn't have a Supreme Court then, but basically the Supreme Court of the territory. Uh, he, then he described the city as pleasant as a pleasantly situated place that was improving. Uh, its improvement, he noted, um, depended on it, quote, continuing to be the seat of government. Uh, efforts were, um, while efforts are continually being made to remove the capital, would it not be as well to let things move along, allow the country to develop itself, and the territory to become a state, and then be permanently the metropolis. So as some of you may know, um, ever since Tallahassee was created to be the state capital, there have been movements to move the state capital to another Florida city. Uh, the latest one, I think, was in the 1960s, you know, a serious attempt. Um, and that was, you know, to move it to Orlando, central Florida, centrally located. South Florida, Central Florida by that time is growing, well, population is much greater than North Florida. You have powerful uh, legislators from those areas, and they're like, you know, why do we have to go up to this little southern town in North Florida every year? Why can't we have a centralized capital? But it was always defeated, and as we know, it remains the capital. Uh, he didn't always have kind words in his diary for some of the political figures in Tallahassee. Governor Duvall who was the first territorial governor, he, he noted that he was an outstanding storyteller, and Duvall was. He was a, a very funny and a, a great speaker. Uh, but he, uh, according to um, Reed, he was somewhat of a, quote, ninny. Uh, he called Governor John Eaton, who was the second territorial governor, a rowdy, and his wife, and we're not going to go into all this right now, his wife, Peggy Eaton Timberlake, excuse me, Peggy Timberlake, uh, excuse me, his wife, Peggy, called her a drunk or crazy. Uh, when Eaton had married Peggy, uh, 
there was a big scandal in, about her past in Washington. It really split up the Jackson administration, but that is another story. On the other hand, he only had kind words for Call. And one thing I left out is that Call had a really fiery temperament. I mean, he got upset, obviously, when he was dismissed by Jackson, but he seemed to be upset a lot. So this is kind of strange. Uh, Reed says that um, Call and his wife were high-minded, unsophisticated, but good-hearted. Uh, and when, he, when Reed learned that Call was going to be appointed governor, Reed thought he might be appointed governor. This is Call's first term. Uh, he wrote a letter to Call, and he was very you know, nice to uh, Richard Keith Call. Uh, and he said, um, while he would have been flattered to receive the position, I hasten to assure you with a perfect frankness that nothing would give me more pleasure than to hear that you had been appointed governor of Florida. Uh, I don't know what Call said when he was dismissed and Reed took his place after his first term, but those were very nice words for Call on Reed's part. Uh, when Reed entered office, he was right in the middle of, well, it was getting near its end, but it was still intense. The Seminole War was going on, but the main crisis, of course, was still that banking crisis, the financial crisis that he had to deal with. Um, by the late 1830s, as I mentioned, we have the rise of Democratic and Whig parties. Reed is a firm Democrat. He, along with David Levy Uly and James Westcott, who will become our first senators under statehood uh, uh, in 1845, they really were running the Democratic Party uh, in territorial Florida. Um, Reed and his supporters, as I mentioned, were known as anti-bank men. Uh, and there were pro-bank men who basically were those who supported the Whig Party. This banking crisis intensified when Reed was governor. It really came almost a, a, a war, in a sense, a civil unrest, uh, particularly in Tallahassee, um, between the factions who supported the banks and the factions that were against the banks. There was a famous duel fought between uh, a leading anti-bank supporter named Lee Reed, and you can get all these names mixed up. Reed is named, the governor is R-E-I-D. This guy is R-E-A-D. They weren't related as far as I know. He was anti-bank and a real hothead as, you know, and then his main opponent politically and personally was a guy named Augustus Alston who was pro-bank. They fought a duel on the Georgia-Florida border north of Tallahassee. One reason a lot of duels were fought up in that area because the border between Georgia and Florida was still kind of undetermined. Uh, territorial and state governors and all the way up into the 1870s, there was this argument between the two states about what was a definite border until it was settled. So you could go over there, maybe you were in Georgia, maybe you in Florida, it'd be hard maybe for the uh, authorities to figure that out. They fought a duel and um, uh, Reed killed uh, Alston in this duel. Um, but Alston's brother, Willis Alston, uh, attacked Reed at a later date. There was a big banquet at the City Hotel, which I'll mention somewhat in more detail later. Reed survived the attack. Alston, the brother, got away, but returned in April of 1841 to finally kill Reed. And then he escaped to Texas. Um, so this bank faction violence is going on. Reed is governor. He even called out the militia to try to stem what was going on. The pro-bank people said, hey, you called them out, and they're led by anti-bank people. You know, you're being biased. Anyway, those were some of the problems that he had to deal with. As I mentioned, Reed also had a tragic personal life um, before leaving St. Augustine to take up his office in Tallahassee. He received news of the death of his daughter, Janet, in Tallahassee. She was living in Tallahassee at a place known as the Blackwood Plantation. And when Reed would go to Tallahassee to sit on the Superior Court, he stayed at Blackwood Plantation with his daughter. She had married a man named Charles Black, who was deceased. She had inherited uh, the property. And um, so he stayed with her and her second husband, uh, John Graham. Uh, and he lived there while he was in Tallahassee as governor. 
um, during his, and he also learned that, um, this is all happening while he's governor, he also learned that his son James, who was in the Navy, who was commanding a small ship called the Seagull, which was part of an expedition, very interesting, a fatal expedition to survey Antarctica, uh, the ship went down and he was killed. So he had to deal with that tragedy. And when Reed left office in March of 1841, um, he remained in Tallahassee at Blackwood, but unfortunately, um, in July of 1841, in that summer of 1841, there was a terrible epidemic of yellow fever in Tallahassee. Many people died. Uh, his daughter Rosalie died, and then a few days later, on July 1st, 1841, Reed succumbed, uh, died of, of yellow fever, um, and this was followed by the death of his son-in-law, John Graham, a few days later. Reed and family members are buried at Blackwood Harwood Cemetery in Tallahassee, and there's a picture of that small cemetery out in the middle of what is now a subdivision, but thank goodness they've allowed this little wooded area to remain. Not only is Governor Reed buried there and members of his family, but also another um, uh, Florida governor, Governor Millard Fillmore Caldwell, who was governor in the late 1940s. His family had acquired that property. His wife's maiden name was Harwood. They combined Blackwood Harwood that was the name of the plantation when he owned it, and nothing remains of the plantation anymore. Like I said, there's a subdivision around the cemetery, but he is also buried there. Okay. I get the time again, sorry. Let's turn now to the statehood period and talk a little bit about Governor Thomas Brown, who, as I mentioned at the beginning, was our second governor under statehood. If Richard Keith Call was very hot-headed and Robert Raymond Reed often you know, full of melancholy and depression, Brown seems to have had a very pleasant, moderate disposition. In fact, when he was nominated as the Whig Party candidate for governor in 1848, the Whig newspapers touted him as old matter of fact. Um, in contrast to the Whig presidential nominee, Zachary Taylor, who many of you know is called old rough and ready. So it's just saying this guy, if he's governor, you know, he's going to take things in a, a simple, direct uh, course, be a very steady hand at the helm. Although by today's presidential standards, he was a young man. He was 63 when he became governor. That was quite old to become governor. He was one of the oldest men to become governor uh, in 1848. Um, Brown was born in Virginia in 1785. He actually served in the militia during the War of 1812. He served a couple of terms in Virginia's House of Delegates. But he had heard about, and people in his area in Virginia had, heard, had been spreading the word about the possibilities in the Florida Territory for settlers. So in the mid-1820s, he went down to scout out the Tallahassee area, really liked what he saw. He acquired land on Lake Jackson, which is uh, uh, northwest of Tallahassee, where he's gonna have a plantation and try to grow sugarcane. And then he brings his, um, eventually brings his family down there and also about 60 or one figure said 140 enslaved persons to work on this plantation. Um, and in his uh, memoir, he wrote a memoir in his the last years of his life. Unfortunately, from a Florida perspective, most of it's about his time in Virginia, but he really fell in love with the Tallahassee area calling Lake Jackson, quote, a beautiful inland sea. And it is a beautiful inland sea when it's there, but it's also a huge sinkhole that disappears periodically. Um, uh, so the enslaved people cleared the land. He had this plantation. He's trying to grow sugarcane. One of his daughters, um, like her father, uh, later in life, uh, wrote a memoir. Um, her name was Elizabeth or Lizzie. 
and she talked about this sugarcane uh, growing that was going on at the, the plantation. She also talked about the fact that for a little while they had a, as the plant plantation work was going on, they had a house in town in the center of Tallahassee near the Capitol building right next to Governor Duvall's home, which was perched on a hill overlooking what is today Cascades Park. If you've been to Tallahassee, you may have been to Cascades Park. Well, back in the territorial period, and unfortunately until it was polluted and then built over, there was this beautiful cascade, a spring, a waterfall right there by the Capitol building, and that's where they had their house. Uh, unfortunately for um, Brown, a freeze came in November of 1828 and destroyed his crop of sugar cane. He also had other debts, so he gives up on that, ends up selling most of his land there to Governor Call, for, who increased his plantation named Orchard Pond in the same area. And um, Brown will take his family, go into Tallahassee, and enter the hotel business. He didn't have any experience in that, but I guess he figured, i got to make a living. Let's give this a try. He was also a member, like Governor Call, an early member of St. John's Episcopal Church, which is the second oldest uh, church in Tallahassee, the first being what is today Trinity United Methodist Church. Um, they were early congregants. Sometimes before a church building was built, there were services held at Call's House, the Grove. Uh, the church building was finally completed in uh, 1837, 1838. So Brown turns to the hotel business. He becomes the manager of what was the most popular hotel at the time, the Planners Hotel, which was down on Capitol Square, right across from the little Capitol building at that time. He also, then he moved to acquire the Florida Hotel, and he consolidated those two hotels into a much larger hotel, which was called the City Hotel, but became known as Brown's after him. And there's a picture of the City Hotel about 1870. It was the center of a lot of the political activity in Tallahassee and social activity. They had all sorts of events and feasts there, so Brown was right in the middle of all of that. Brown uh, identified with the growing Whig movement, like Call. Uh, he had served in the, the Legislative Council. Um, he served in the Territorial House and Senate. Um, he was So he was pro-bank. Um, he was for internal improvements, which would mainly be railroads and, and, and regular roads, too. Um, it's interesting, though, that Brown became a Whig because one of the largest factions of, in the Whig Party were men who were anti-Masonic. They didn't like the Masons. Uh, and Brown was a very proud Mason, but he became a Whig nevertheless. In 1832, just kind of an aside here, he formed the Tallahassee Jockey Club and so started organized horse racing in the capital city. Although he said, I never bet on a race in my life, not one dollar. So you can believe that maybe or maybe not. Um, in 1848, Brown, who was this prominent figure in Tallahassee uh, and in Whig circles, is nominated by the Whig party as their governor, gubernatorial candidate. He ran against William Bailey, who was from Jefferson, neighboring Jefferson County, the Democratic candidate, and he won by about 300 or so votes. So he becomes the second governor behind William Mosley, who I mentioned earlier, who was elected in May of 1845. However, there's a problem. This is unique in Florida political history. Um, Mosley was governor, but he became governor in May of 1845, and under Florida's constitution, you served a four-year term. He says, okay, Brown's elected, you come in, and also you had to be sworn in on the first Monday in October. He says, well, he can do that, become the next governor in October of 1849, because I started serving in 1845, and I knew this was going to be an issue one day. So back in 1845, he had even gotten the legislature to rule on this. You know, uh, when would he have to leave office? And they basically said, well, four-year term, it would be 1849. Brown, however, and the Whigs said, no, um, his term really should have started in May of 1844. 
and then I will be sworn in in October of 1848. But Mosley said, you know, the hell with that. Uh, I'm going to stay where I am because I wasn't even elected, and we were still a territory in May of 1844. Well, the Whigs uh, in the fall and in January of 1845, they're in town in Tallahassee. The Territorial Council had met every year, but at this time it's changing to a biennial legislature. So they're not going to be back until 1850. Um, and so they decide we're just going to go ahead and have an inaugural ceremony anyway. So they won control of the legislative council in the 1848 elections. So they, on January 13th, 1849, in the evening in the House chamber, the Whigs inaugurate Brown as governor. And even though technically, I guess, technically he was not governor, it kind of sounds like, hey, there are two competing governors out there. So Brown is inaugurated, but he will become governor in October of 1849. Brown's, the main issues he had to confront during his four years in office was this growing sectional crisis between North and South over slavery. Uh, like Call, he was a big unionist. He believed that the country had to be kept together at all costs. He supported what was known as the Compromise of 1850, to try to find a compromise between the North and South on slavery. A lot of, uh, of course, diehard uh, pro-slavery people in the South were very much against the Compromise of 1850. And those factions, who were mostly Democrats uh, at the time, they wanted to send delegates, official state delegates, to a Southern convention that would be held in Nashville that year in 1850 to protest the Compromise of 1850 and to discuss perhaps, you know, down the road, secession. Brown would have none of it, so we're not sending an official delegation. I don't approve of this. He wrote a very caustic letter, uh, which was published and saying, you know, this is just ridiculous. We're not going to do this. Um, and so he does not appoint an official delegation. They send an unofficial delegation, but he prevailed in that issue at least for the time being. He was a big supporter, uh, like call, of internal improvements. Uh, he wanted to build railroads because we still only had that one Tallahassee railroad from the capital down to St. Mark's. And even though he's going to push to do that, there really isn't going to be much railroad growth during his time, but he kind of laid the foundation uh, for that. Brown uh, leaves office after his four-year term his last political campaign was in 1854 when he ran for Congress and lost. By that time, the Whigs were really on the way out. You know, the Whigs will die and the Republican Party will rise out of the old Whig Party and elements of the Democratic Party. So as the country is moving towards, you know, what will be secession, Brown was a vociferous opponent of secession, um, said this, just, this, this, you know, will ruin the country, and I can't believe we're even talking about it. But once Florida has seceded, you know, he's old, his you know, family's there in Tallahassee, he supports Florida, you know, uh, patriotic uh, Confederate, I guess. Uh, he dies in Tallahassee on August 24th, 1867, and buried with his wife, Elizabeth, who died in 1848. They are buried in the old city cemetery, which is right across from the front of Florida State's campus. And by the way, in this picture, this really kind of interesting picture, that is Brown in the last year of his life. That's one of his daughters. Her name was uh, Margaret or Mag, as she was known. So let me turn to our last, um, the last governor I'm going to talk about. Uh, and this is Governor John Milton. Okay, well, we won't cover his whole life. So anyway, I'm mentioning Milton because he is the first governor to die in office, and the method of his death is very controversial. So um, I thought it would be interesting to mention him and also the fact that I've done research on Milton. He's an interesting character. Um, so John Milton, uh, he was born in Georgia. That's where he started his political career. He had a really 
rough and rowdy early life. He killed a guy in Columbus, Georgia, in a duel who really shot him down in the street. They were political opponents. But his wife, excuse me, his wife's family had property in Jackson County, you know, where Mary Ann is. And so when he ended up in Florida in 1845, the year Florida became a state, uh, his wife, um, I think she had passed away. Anyway, he ends up inheriting this property, and that's going to be where he builds a plantation called, he called it Sylvania, uh, and he's going to spend his most of his years there in Jackson County as a prosperous planter, slave owner, and attorney. He was a very successful uh, attorney. Um, in 1860, Milton, um, who's getting up there in age, um, is nominated by the Democratic Party in this very crucial year, you know, the year before the Civil War. And after many, many ballots, the Democrats held their nominating convention in Quincy, which actually is where my house is today, um, the little town 20 miles west of Tallahassee in the courthouse. And Milton, after all these ballots, he was nominated, became the Democratic nominee for governor, and he's going to win that race in October of uh, of 1860. But like Governor Brown, because of the weirdness of our original Constitution, he will not become governor, in fact, until October of 1861. So he's governor-elect for a whole year, and the Civil War breaks out in April of 1861. Milton, although he never served in the military uh, officially, he did serve in the militia in Alabama. He spent many years in Alabama, by the way, uh, he had kind of a military mindset. He took the, the position of commander-in-chief as governor. He took that uh, literally and was very interested in military affairs. So and on October 7th, 1861, Milton is um, inaugurated as governor. Now, I used to work at the State Archives of Florida where we have all the gubernatorial papers. Some gubernatorial papers are very thin, others are huge. Some governors we don't have much on. We do have Milton's letter books, which are very interesting. However, he's the only governor for which we do not have an inaugural, a copy of his inaugural address. I've looked everywhere, every conceivable place. It was probably published in the local Democratic newspaper, the Floridian and Advocate, as it was called, on October 12th. So he was inaugurated on the 7th. It came out as a weekly, but we don't have an issue. We don't have a copy of that date. Um, so no inaugural address. I did have a hope that I would find something about the inaugural through a secondhand account. I uh, um, came across this diary of a young Confederate officer who spent several months in Tallahassee in the fall of 1861, who even attended the inaugural ceremony uh, and, and the party that occurred after the ball that occurred afterwards. But all he commented, and he's a young guy, you know, 21, is on how pretty the women are in Tallahassee. Nothing about uh, the inaugural address. So uh, Milton is governor uh, of Florida uh, during the Civil War. Of course, he's mainly concerned with trying to defend Florida from a possible Union invasion. As you know, the Union has a blockade around the Confederacy, and of course, Florida was a key a link in that chain of blockade. So the Florida economy, like much of the South, suffers during the war, even though Florida had a small population and a small white population, and a small part of that white population that was eligible for military service. It did end up sending over 5,000 troops to fight. Many of them left the state to fight in Virginia and up in Tennessee. So during Milton's uh, governorship, he is really focused on <clears throat> maintaining the Florida militia because most of the regular troops are outside of the state. So if the Union invades, and he was worried about the Union invading in the Gulf area where Apalachicola is, which also happened to be north of that where his plantation was, and also, of course, on the east coast by Amelia Island where the Union did land eventually, he's concerned with, you know, the fact that Florida doesn't have many means to defend itself. Um, and that takes up a great part of his time. He also feuded with the legislature. They actually created something called the Executive Council to kind of rein him in. That didn't last too long. So it's a very tumultuous, obviously, during the war administration. 
Uh, in fact, when he first took office, he called it a deranged state of affairs uh, in a letter to Stephen Mallory, who was the Confederate Secretary of Navy. Um, so I can't don't have time to go into great detail about uh, his administration, but I do want to mention the, the how his administration ended. As we all know, by 1865, uh, the Confederacy is about to lose the war. Uh, Grant has besieged Petersburg in Virginia, is closing the noose on Richmond. Um, General Sherman has marched through Georgia and is moving into South Carolina. Florida, which really, you know, did play a, a role, an important role in the war as a source of provisions for the Confederate Army, particularly beef and other goods. Uh, as a military asset, though, it was just kind of ignored. The North really didn't pay too much attention. There were some incursions, as we all know, but really not that much. Nevertheless, in March of 1865, the North launched an expedition to the south of Tallahassee. Remember, I mentioned St. Mark's as the terminus of the Tallahassee Railroad. Well, there's an old fort there the Spanish had originally built, and the Americans had it, and the Confederates had it. So they wanted to take the port of St. Mark's and then eventually, um, if they could, move up and maybe take Tallahassee. That wasn't the original plan, but they thought if resistance was weak, maybe we can do that. They ended up marching towards Tallahassee, and south of town, they were met by a combined army of you know, uh, regular soldiers, militia, even some young cadets, um, like uh, the predecessor to the University of Florida, uh, in Gainesville, there was a military academy that later became Florida State uh, in Tallahassee. And some of those young boys went to fight in this Battle of Natural Bridge in March of 1865. One of Milton's own sons fought in that battle. He was one of those young cadets. By many accounts, he was very depressed and almost ill by this time. Of, you know, everything is coming down, you know. And so... On April 1st, he traveled, as he did often during his governorship, and I forgot to mention, and I have had to pass over these two gentlemen too, the city hotel in Tallahassee that Brown owned, that's where Milton, since there was no governor's residence, he lived and did a lot of his work during the war, but he liked to go back to his plantation, his wife felt safer there in Jackson County during the war, she and the children lived on that plantation, so he would go back and forth a lot. On April 1st, 1865, he traveled to his plantation in Jackson County, and late in the afternoon, a gunshot was heard. His son, um, William Henry Milton, rushed into his father's study and found him dead of a gunshot wound. Uh, most accounts say it was a, a rifle or a shotgun, and I don't want to get too gory or anything, but so you know, the top of his head was taken off. Now, immediately, many people in the surrounding area in Tallahassee and the few newspapers that were still publishing said this was a suicide, that he had been depressed, or maybe they didn't even say that. They said he took his own life. The family insisted, as they would probably, that it was not a suicide, that this gun that killed him was always had problems and that, you know, there, there may, it may have been loaded and they... It's, he talked about going out squirrel hunting, and they say it's an accident. They even published an article in a local newspaper saying it was accidental. And people that say it was an accident say, well, if it was a suicide, why is he buried in uh, the, the Episcopal Church in Mariana? Well, there were people that were buried at that time, even though it was suicide. We like to think that oh, that didn't happen at all, but it did. So my point is, is that nobody was in the room with him. We don't know of any suicide letter or anything. I've gone back and forth on this, but my conclusion is we just can't say for certain. But the fact is, is that he was the first governor to die in office on April 1st, 1865. Uh, uh, governor, the man who became governor by the name of Allison was the president of the Senate. And under the constitution, we didn't have a lieutenant governor at that time he became the next governor. Unfortunately for him, he's the guy now is saddled with, okay, you're the Confederate governor of Florida. Confederacy is surrendering. We're putting you in prison. Um, anyway, uh, that's my story about some of Florida's governors and their connection to Tallahassee. Uh, 
Tomorrow, when I'm giving this talk, if I use my time better, I might be able to mention these two other guys that I put up up here for a reason. Thank you very much. And as always, Florida memory from the Florida archives with so many great photos. Uh, another resource that many of you may be familiar with, newspapers.com. It's just a great resource for old newspapers. Thank you. And the Tallahassee Historical Society is, you know, basically promoting this event, these events this week in Tallahassee. Um, and they, as you can see, they've been around a long time. Thanks. Thanks again, uh, Boyd. This was great. Any any questions or comments? A big part of our early history in the state. And you know, um, I was I was just struck as as you were um, talking, Boyd, about the the value of preserving political papers, archives, um, because they really become the source of our understanding of, uh, of our history, and diaries. I, I will say too that this is not just totally out of the blue, this talk. Um, we do have, excuse me, some of the papers of each of those governors that I talked about at UF. Not a lot, but there are some correspondence from each of those governors in our collections. Most of their papers are at the state archives because they're governors and so forth. So, um, with that, uh, we'll thank uh, Boyd again. Next week, um, uh, the Library Special Collections is sending over Rebecca Jefferson. Uh, some of you may remember Rebecca. She's spoken here um, in the past. And she's going to be speaking on, um, I think her subject is uh, two Victorian ladies who um, discovered some remarkable documents in the, in the Middle East um, uh, relating to uh, uh, Judaism and, and uh, um, um, history in that period. It's kind of an adventure. I think you're going to enjoy it. So uh, please join us then. Thank you. Thank you again. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Ron and Julie. Thank you.